Hi, and welcome to Fuel Your Mind TV, the television program brought to you from the Muscatine Community College campus, where we take you behind the scenes and introduce you to the people who work here and the students who attend here. Today is the alumni edition of Fuel Your Mind TV, and with us we have a very special guest. I'm Katie Watson, your host, and I've brought with me someone as a co-host who is qualified not because of his rugged good looks, or because of his accolades in the classroom, but because he too is a student of history and a fellow agriculturalist, Jeff Kaufman. Welcome, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm glad to be here with this distinguished fellow. Exactly. <laughs> we have with us, you know we've been <laughs> celebrating 80 years at Muscatine Community College, um, over 80 years now, and who we have with us today is a gentleman who we have celebrated as an outstanding alum, Mr. Claude Gifford, who I refer to as Uncle Claude. How about that? You are my great uncle. At least that. At if least. Not, if not great, great. You are my great, great <laughs> uncle. And I am. <coughs> I am who to you? Well, you'd be my. I don't know, in-law of some kind, a great, great in-law. Exactly. <laughs> we are proud. all the time as great. Exactly. I want you to know that. <laughs> That's why we have him. <laughs> you, Claude Gifford, were here in the late 30s. You were recently honored at Muscatine High School. So not only do the people of Muscatine Community College honor you, but the people at Muscatine High School celebrate you in their Hall of Honor as an outstanding alum. That's pretty proud tidings, I would say. They, they simply haven't caught up with me yet. That's I don't think they've read. I don't think they've read all of the history because this is a pretty ornery guy, I must say. Hmm. Um, tell us a little bit. You, you were here it was 19. 37, you graduated from Muscatine right. High School. Yeah. Now, you're an Illinois boy, yeah. so some people don't know that. Uh, back in the day, tell us, um, how did an Illinois boy get to Muscatine High School? Well, that's about 10 miles. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I mean, uh, grade school, uh, we did not live in a high school district and it cost a hundred dollars to come to high school in Muscatine. That's quite a bit. Yeah, but the year that I graduated, they, uh, the state paid that tuition, so that made it possible for, uh, for me to come over. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have made right. it. Right. I yeah. bet there were a lot of people who couldn't. Yeah. That's a lot of money in, in yes, the day. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you crossed the bridge. Did you have to pay <clears throat> toll? Not as a student. Um, Oftentimes, in the early part of my days, uh, I stayed uh, with Nellie and Russell Watson. Oh, you, that's you know my in-laws. In-laws. Uh, I stayed there the, the, the first year that, that I was in uh, high school. And um, subsequently to that, then I uh, worked for my room and board in Muscatine at Ma Hayes' hash house. <laughs> at the corner of uh, Fourth and Cedar, which is now a parking lot. Okay. Right, right across from the Muscatine Journal. Okay. So I worked there for uh, the rest of my high school career and while I was at junior college as well. Now, agriculture played a big part of your beginning, and um, as we were visiting earlier, you were an FFA member. Yes, indeed. Yes. I was a 4-H member, of course, back on the farm in Illinois, and then uh, here at Muscatine High School, of course, I was in FFA and um, had a very outstanding teacher in Bud Hoops. My father-in-law talks about him as well. Have you yeah. heard that name, Jeff? Yeah, sure have, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Bud Hoops did more for the rural areas around surrounding Muscatine, Illinois and in Iowa, and for the agricultural culture and development of this area than any other single human being. I would attribute FFA to everything 
I have become. Great, great. And I don't know if you would say uh, the leadership, the public speaking, the self-confidence. All, all of Were you that. an FFA member, Jeff? I was not, but my, my kids were, my sons kids were. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know of a better student organization. Well, that, that's right. It's for a useful purpose. It uses the energies of people and teaches them the elements of leadership, teaches them to work together on committees, mm -hmm. to be uh, cooperative and understanding, uh, and to do their best. Right, yeah. it does. Yeah. Uh, we, and we're lucky we have very good FFA leaders in this area, mm -hmm. every school district, <clears throat> every well, school district. Yeah. Well, I, I read about those here at, at Muscatine mm -hmm. and the honors that they win. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, they must have outstanding instructors to, to do that so con consistently. So tell us, um, move on to your college days. You came here um, as a MCC student. We were junior college then, yes, MJC. that's right, yeah. Um, we, have, <coughs> we have, if Chad would like to zoom in, check out this handsome fella. Let's see, where are we? I don't know if Chad can zoom in. Talk a little bit about who these fellas are. Well, it looks like the basketball team for the It does, you're college. in your undies. Yeah, I don't that, know we're why. In our undies. But it, it happens to Chad's be. Chad's going to zoom in. You keep talking, Chad's going to zoom. <laughs> it, we're it we're happen, a one man show, Claude. Yeah, you got to give us time. It happens to be the four members of the debate team. Okay. And we worked out at the Y, and somebody took that picture. So that's the only existing picture of those four of us in, in that attire where we look like we're basketball no, players. No, I'm backwards here. This is Claude right here. Correct, yeah. Who became a national debate. We don't even have debate anymore, do we, Joe? Not at, not at the, uh, MCC, we don't. In don't. high school, we do. Don't high school, we do. And Gee, we have, whiz. I mean, we have amateur debate fighting with Jeff every day, huh. but no professional well, you, or you, organized you, debate team like we did well, when you well, were here. Well, you, you ought to have, you know, really. <laughs> there but, you go. There's yeah. the recommendation right yeah. there. So yeah. after beyond <laughs> debate team, um, you were an MCC student and then on to Iowa State? Yes, yes. Still in agriculture or what, what was your major there? Yes, it was. I got a Sears Roebuck scholarship to Iowa State, which paid the tuition for the first year. And um, I enrolled in ag economics. I went out there to check it out and uh, so they, they gave me an outstanding graduate student as a person that I could talk with, and I said I wanted to come to learn how to write about economics and make it something that people could understand. And he said, well, I, I wouldn't recommend that. He says you either ought to be a, either a journalist or an economist because they don't go together. So if I had given up and taken his advice, then I would not have been with Farm Journal magazine ever, you know, or had the experiences that I had where I combined journalism and economics with the entire idea of writing about something that's useful to people. Very good. Well, Claude, let, yeah. let me, uh, you want to move on towards the, uh, from your <coughs> Farm Journal days to yeah. a, what, I, a, what I would consider when reading your life story. Uh, that pivotal moment when you were asked to write a speech for President Eisenhower. So fill in, take us from Iowa State to the Farm Journal up to the point where you got that call to write the well, speech. Well, what 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 goes on in between those times? Well, that, that's a long, long time. A little war. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> there was that war. Hmm. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Iowa State, my roommate, who was from Scott County, went home for the weekend, and he came back with uh, a grocery bag with oat plants sticking out. And I said, what's this? And he said, well, the, something wrong with the oats. They aren't doing well. So I'm taking this over to the USDA specialist at Iowa State to find out what the problem is. <clears throat> so in a few days, I said, what, what was the problem? He said, well, it's a, a disease of oats called Helminthosporium blight. And it started in the Southwest and has moved up in, into the Midwest. And the most, uh, the oat variety that's most planted in the Midwest is uh, susceptible to this. So I was doing a, uh, on the side, a, a tape program for WMT at Cedar Rapids because in my student days, uh, I was uh, active at WOI as a student announcer and 
and, and knew the person who was director of the station who subsequently had moved to um, WMT to head up that station. So when I came back from the service, he got in touch with me and said, could you do a program that you would tape at Iowa State at WOI and send it up to uh, Cedar Rapids? He says, we have sold program time on Saturday and we don't have a program, but I, I think maybe if you would agree to that, that it would be an interesting program to carry this advertising that we have. So I said to my roommate, well, then I'll do a story about this Helminthus Borium blight and went to see the USDA specialist about it. He said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that with you. I can't have an interview with you because we haven't yet decided what we're going to do about this disease. And it's creeped up, it's crept up on us. And so we're either embarrassed by the progress it, it's made and so little we've done about it. And, and so we don't know what we're going to do. He says it's on the desk of the president to decide whether we make this public. I said, all right, why don't we do a program and if the president decides that we can release it, well, then we'll have it. So that's what we did. And the president at that time? The president was Friley. Okay. Dr. Friley. Okay. So this was a 4th of July week that this has happened. So I wrote a, a freelance article for Farm Journal and airmailed it to them and, and then sent them a telegram and, you know, said whole space for important story coming, which kind of, you know, what would you call that? Uh, uh, here's a student telling Farm Journal. So arrogant. I'd Maybe. call it bold. Yeah. <laughs> I'd call it bold. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the story ran and they paid me $100 for it. And um, so as a result of that, a couple of years later, meantime, I had gone to the university. I, I went to Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, with the, uh, a dairy magazine and with the Dairy Cattle Congress as the manager in waiting. Ed Esso was the manager and he was going to retire in a while. Then I got an invitation to go to the University of Illinois as an assistant extension editor. So I decided that I would take that. So I went to the University of Illinois. So now, uh, a year later, uh, Farm Journal got in touch with me and said that they were hiring a new editor and um, would I like to come to Chicago and be interviewed? So I talked with the, uh, assist or the extension editor and he thought I ought to go. I said, well, if they're hiring a new editor, there are all kinds, you know, the woods are full of editors across the country, the various farm magazines, state farm magazines, commodity magazines, and so on. So I'm just starting out. He said, well, if I were you, I'd go and be interviewed. So I went to Chicago and had an interview uh, with Carol Streeter, who was the editor, or managing editor of Farm Journal. And he was interviewing candidates in Chicago, and I was the last one he interviewed. And he recalled this article that I had sent to them. And, um, and so he interviewed me, and at the end of the interview, he said, uh, all right, he said, I've made up my mind. The job is yours if you want it. Had they ever released that article that you had sent? Oh, yes. They yeah. did release oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They, yeah, oh, I yeah. You I got $100 thinking, for yeah, it. Yeah, and okay. I got $100 for the, for the article. Meantime, it was, it was released in, in, in Iowa at the, at the same time. So I'd actually scooped the uh, field editor of Farm Journal, who was located in Cedar Rapids. Um, so this is all a part of my getting to. Farm Journal. That and what year? Right. And what year was that in the <clears throat> interview? That was in 1948. 48. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because you had to go to war in that time, so I mean, yeah, some I, yeah, time I was, passed. I was back. I was back yeah. uh, from from the war. Came back in 45. <coughs> finished uh, at Iowa State in 46. And uh, there were 3,000 of us came back to Iowa State. And uh, so uh, one day at paternity house, uh, <coughs> three or four guys showed up and started talking with me <coughs> and said, um, we'd like for you to run to be president of the, of the veteran. I said, well, why should I do that? Well, we think that you could win it. <coughs> and besides the fellow who is after the job, we, we don't want him to have it. So if you'll agree to run, we'll run your campaign. So I said, well, what do I have to lose? You know, if you're running the campaign. 
So they ran the campaign. So I became the uh, president of the Iowa State Veterans Organization. <coughs> so that's part of the background before getting to Farm Journal. At Farm Journal, I started out as a livestock editor, and I was a livestock editor the first four years. And um, it was a very lively time. As a part of that time, there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Canada. And oh, I, I hate that stuff. Yeah, so I went to Canada to, to cover that outbreak. And uh, it just happened that that previous week I had been at the USDA gathering material for an article on the exotic livestock diseases around the world that we didn't have and the need that we had would had for a, uh, a, a research center somewhere off the coast where they could do research on these exotic diseases. Okay. Like mad cow or yeah, something? Yeah, so I had just come back from Washington, D.C., had that article all written, ap approved, and, and down in Washington, D.C. with USDA when this outbreak occurred of foot and mouth disease. So that issue ran the spread article that I had on exotic diseases and the article on the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Canada and the picture that they used was they, they dug a big pit uh, in, in, the, in the frozen prairie, this is in February, uh, to put the diseased cattle in yeah. and those exposed oh. because you, there's no cure for it so you have to kill off the animals. So they dug this big pit and uh, then brought the cattle in, trucked them in, walked them in, them in, and closed the end of the pit. And then Canadian Mounties stood up on the piles of soil at the side and shot the cattle. So the picture used in the Farm Journal article was, I saw the cattle shot. Oh, okay. That was a uh, headline that the managing editor, uh, Carol Streeter, put on it. Was this a cover picture? No, no. The cover picture is something that's planned in far in advance. Okay. And usually okay. is, you know, th this was on the spot of the moment. Got it. Uh, and the cover is always in four color, which takes a while to run, you know, and so on. Yeah. Pretty graphic. Yeah, yeah. So. So then, after four years as a livestock editor, I went to the managing editor one day and I said, Everywhere I go, there's increasing talk about the uh, uh, need for marketing information, management information, uh, worried about farm policy and, and the importance of exports and so on. And uh, I would like to become the economics editor and cover the area of marketing, farm management, policy, exports, and so on. Now I'd like to call that guy at Iowa State and tell him I told him so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I can tell you about him. He, he wrote a bulletin one time. He went to another university, which was so dense you couldn't read it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, so he said, well, frankly, I think the uh, position as livestock editor is more important than that. And I said, I still would like to try it. He said, okay, if you want to try it, you go ahead. So then I became the economics editor okay. at that time. And uh, covering more politics, too. Covering more politics, yeah. yeah what they're down to USDA at least once a month and spent two or three days there, made calls on people who knew what was going on and so forth. And uh, then started getting invitations to speak at, at uh, meetings around. I spoke at the uh, American Farm Bureau uh, National Convention and I was spoke at a batch of state Farm Bureau meetings and commodity meetings, the wheat growers, the corn growers, and and people, the livestock people, and so on. So I got a call from the White House one day and said, we'd like for you to come down. And President Eisenhower is going to give a radio address on, on agriculture. We'd like for you to come down and, uh, and write it. So I went down and got a room at the Hay Adams Hotel where you look out across Jefferson Square and there's a White House over there. And so I'm at, at the Hay Adams and so I went over to see them and, and um, they, they talked about the speech and I said, okay, what materials do you have? They said, what materials? I said, well, what do you want in the speech? Well, we don't know what we want in the speech. That's why you're <laughs> That's here. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why you're here. So I go over to the Hay Adams and 
into the night and look out the window, and Ike's over there fast asleep, you know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write something that sounds like Ike and is important enough that it's a national address and wondering why they didn't ask his brother, Milton Eisenhower, to, to write it. Milton was president of Penn State at the time, but had been information director of the USDA back in his early days when he and Ike were both in Washington, D.C., and Milton was the better known of the two. Huh. Ike was there going to the Army College, and Milton was uh, information director of USDA. So I'm over there. Because they're brothers, that's why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm wondering, why didn't they have Milton write it? So I took it over, um, and I got a phone call about the middle of the morning the next morning. Is it ready yet? And I said, what do you mean, is it ready yet? I just got this assignment last night. <laughs> you know? So I learned that that's the way you do things in government. You know, you want it yesterday. Yep. You, you can think about it. You know you're going to need it, but you never get around to getting the, the thing you know, lined up until the last minute. So <clears throat> I wrote the article, I wrote the speech, took it over to them. At the end of that week, everybody around the world looked up and saw this little light going through the sky, like jerking across the sky. It was Sputnik. Uh -huh. And suddenly, overnight, the entire country was uh, knew that what it must do to increase the, uh, the Russians had come in first, they're in space first, and what we must do to do a better job of educating people and, you know, and, and so on, and we're falling behind. So instead of giving my speech on agriculture, <laughs> he gave a national address on the need to get busy with this kind of work nationally. So the space so that, program. Yeah, space program. So the speech was never given. Wow. Was it a good speech, Claude? Well, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> do, you think the pre do you think the president would have thought it was? Well, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. He, he was a kind-hearted person. <laughs> well, did, was that kind of your, was that your launching pad into your eventual job in 71 with USDA? Do you well, think that's what launched it, or was well, there another pivotal it, moment? Well, no, that, that was a part of it. That was a part of it. Um, um, how, how that happened in 1971 is that uh, Cliff Harden, who was Secretary of Agriculture, invited me to come down for an unveiling of a new farm program. And um, so I went to the meeting at USDA for this part of the farm program that he was unveiling. Afterwards, I went up and congratulated him on the, the, the job he had done. And, and he said, could you walk with me back to my office? I said, sure. So in walking back to the office, he said, uh, the director of information is retiring and I'm having to fill the position. I don't know yet whether I will fill it with uh, somebody from within the department or somebody with commercial experience. He said, could you help me line up prospective people for this job as director of information if I select someone from the commercial world? I said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. And uh, I said, but I, I can't work on it right away. I'm on my way to California uh, out there working on a story. And a matter of fact, I've got to leave in about an hour. So he called a chauffeur in to take Mr. Gifford to the airport. So I went to California. And on the way out there, I put together a list of the qualities that the director of information should have. Then on the side, I listed seven or eight people that I thought in the commercial world could do the job, had the experience, had to get up and go and so on to do it. Then I gave each one of them a number from one to 10 as to how, th how I thought they would do, whether they were a 10 or a two or whatever. And then the next time in Washington, D.C., I went over to see uh, um, the uh, Harden, Secretary Harden, with this list. And he said, well, he hadn't made up his mind yet whether he's going to move up internally or move in somebody from the commercial world. So he said, let's talk about it. Um, and he gave me his home phone number. Call me uh, on Sunday, and we'll talk about it some more. So I called him on Sunday, and he said that uh, he had decided that he was going to go out 
into the commercial world and bring somebody in with a commercial experience. And we got, the question was raised about whether or not I was available. Well, the previous week, I had been uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, came home to uh, uh, Farm Journal on Thursday and had a call from a very close friend of mine to tell me that Farm Journal was for sale. Now that was the first th there was any mention of that possibility. Um, so I conferred with someone, uh, another good friend, on Friday about uh, the meaning of this. And then as I worked in the uh, garden at home on Saturday, I considered my own position and what might happen if it is sold. And he assured me that it was going to be sold. It could be somebody who is much more liberal than I. By this time, I was writing the editorials. Mm -hmm. Could be the owner, could be somebody much more liberal than I or much more conservative than I, the chances that we would agree on things, you know, one out of three, not, not too good, <laughs> so that I might be, uh, feel it necessary to, to do something else Fine. if this took place, you know. So, <clears throat> as I thought about that that weekend and talked with uh, Hardin on Sunday uh, at his home, the question came up, could I do it? So I made up my mind, okay. Um, I said, if, if you want me to do it, I will come. So he called me on Tuesday and says, I have it all lined up up on the hill with the folks on the hill, the political people, lined up with the president and the- uh, Which was uh, Nixon. Yeah, Nixon, yeah, then. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the job is yours. So I went to the president of Farm Journal and the <coughs> editor. The, by this time, Carol Streeter was the editor and told him that I was going to leave. They did not know, you know, that I knew mm. that Farm Journal was for sale. Sneaky. Because the, the person who told me this said, I don't think the editor knows yet. He says that the president knows. <coughs> And he had gone to the owners and he asked to broker the deal in selling the magazine. And they said, no, we're going we're gonna to do that. So I knew the president knew it, but I, I felt that the editor did not yet know this. So when I met with him to tell him I was leaving, the uh, president told me that, well, I will move you up onto, they have a, six people on a planning committee and move you up onto this group and the, the next president of the Farm Journal will come from that group. So I thought to myself, well, the way magazines work, editors are never presidents because editors are spending money. The people who bring in the money, the advertising side, mm -hmm. are always the, the presidents. Because here's Carol Streeter, the best farm magazine editor ever, who is not president because he's editor, he spends money. Dick Babcock, who's head of advertising, is the president because he brings in money right. with advertising. So I'm sitting there thinking, Dick, you probably aren't going to decide who the next editor is going to be. Right, right. <laughs> so he then- promises he can't keep. Yeah, so that, that's a long, long story of how I, I got down to USDA in 1971 as, as head of information. Well, here, here's kind of a couple of big picture okay. questions. From, yeah. So you're served from 71 to 94. Correct. I, yeah. I, not to put you on the spot, yeah. but I'm gonna, I want you to answer two questions. Okay. In that time period, yeah. and you're looking at, at Nixon, Ford, uh, Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., and even uh, Clinton, yeah. out of all of those presidents, which one do you think uh, had the, the best mind and the best interest for agriculture? And then tell me about the most interesting secretary of ag you worked for. Okay. Let's start with the president first. Which president? Would you give the award, the Claude Gifford Award, uh, for uh, the Agriculture Award? Well, I would give it to Reagan, not not I because of, not because of agriculture, but because of what uh, what he what he stood for, and uh, the charisma that he had, um, and with a, with an ear to, the, you know, to the public as to what you know, paying attention to what people are saying and so on. 
and the basic, basic principles he had. The first time I heard him speak, I was at, uh, going through the University of Illinois and had a room at the uh, hotel there, and he gave an address to um, y young people. And I, l I listened to that address, and I thought, you, you know, boy, that, that, that's the guy. He was not yet president at that time. And uh, so I would, I would pick Reagan. Did you get to meet uh, him? No, I didn't. No, I never met him personally. I would love to have met him. Yeah, yeah, never met him personally. No. But you did meet <coughs> you did meet Richard Nixon oh, yes. personally. Yeah. Did you meet any of the other presidents? Yes. Take Nixon first. In the Nixon campaign, I was a member of the elect Nixon Agricultural Committee. Okay. Um, made up of people in in, in the commercial world. And um, then we had uh, we had spent time with him, and and we knew him, and after he was elected, we spent time with him, and uh, and uh, we, we 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 knew Nixon as a result of that. Now, as to the Secretary of Agriculture that I would put at the top of the heap, uh, the most controversial one of all. Earl Butts. Earl Butts. Yep. <laughs> Earl Butts. Well, tell me, tell me why he tops your list. Well, he had the best grounding of any of the secretaries of my nine that I served with. He was the dean of agriculture at Purdue. He served in the Eisenhower administration as an assistant secretary of agriculture. He had that experience. He uh, um, was well known. Uh, I was on a uh, an agricultural group where we were both on the uh, uh, the board of directors of that group at the same time. So I uh, I, I knew him, uh, knew him well, and uh, I knew that uh, he had an excellent uh, background uh, for the job. Now, Cliff Harden, I came came on in June, and. Uh, Early fall of uh, that same year, Cliff Harden asked me to stop off and see him. And he had a, a long yellow pad, and he handwritten, he said, hand it to me, what do you think of this? So I looked at it, and it was his resignation that he was going to give to the president as soon as he got back from a trip that he was going on to, to Africa. As soon as he got back, he was going to give his resignation to uh, the president. I said, you, you can't do that. Why can't I do it? I said, I came here in June. Now already you're leaving, and you're leaving me alone here. You, you can't do that. <laughs> so why do you have this idea that you can do this? He said, well, Ralston Perina has a, a vice president position open. They've offered it to me. He said, I've spent all my life in academic work, mm -hmm. paid well, but not, not, well. not, not <laughs> outstanding. And this is a chance for me to, to put some money together in the interest of my family uh, for me to do that. And that was why he was going to retire. He goes on his trip, comes back. The day before he got back, news broke in Kentucky that a politician in Kentucky is going to be the new Secretary of Agriculture. Nobody knew there was going to be a new Secretary, oh. you see. <laughs> so I went out to Andrews field with, with the chauffeur to meet him as he's coming in on the plane and told him that the story broke and uh, he says well uh, he, he's not going to be the new secretary I said, okay I said the place is swarming with reporters all over the place he said I don't want to meet them I said well, you can't avoid them they're everywhere he said all right I'll have the plane pull up at the end of the runway and um, uh, other folks on board will get off, and then you be out there uh, ready to come out with Tommy and the limousine. And when you see uh, me and my wife come to the top of the stairs, you come out, rush out, and we'll get in and we'll get out of here. Pre 9 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no security. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, we, we did that. Tommy and I raced out there. Well, the reporters saw what was happening, so they started running out. And, and we, we got in the limousine, 
and pulled away as Ernie Brenner, AP guy, ag guy, just reached the limousine and was knocking on the, on the window. <laughs> so the photographer who had been with uh, the secretary on this trip to Africa was there and took a picture of this, of Ernie knocking on the window <laughs> on the limousine. Like Elvis. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, uh, Hardin says, why don't you come out to, to dinner with me? He said, I'm not going to go back to the office. And so I went to dinner with him, and he got a phone call. And he talked on the phone a bit, and he came back, and he says, that's the new secretary. Well, who? That's Earl Butts. So uh, he was telling Earl Butts, come, come on, have dinner with us, and, and Gifford is here, and he can write my resignation uh, you know, speech and your acceptance speech. And uh, so Earl and, and Hardin came you know, we're together. So I wrote this on his daughter's typewriter. And it happened that the letter E uh, was broken. So I'm writing this, you know, the, the two statements. The, 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 the E's do not show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, well, now that he's going to get this big money with Ross and Perina, maybe he'll buy his daughter a decent <laughs> typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, do you, how is, in, in your opinion, yeah. you've had a lot of years to observe Secretaries of Agriculture, yeah. how, is, how is Tom Vilsack doing right now? He's an Iowa boy. What, where, what, what comments uh, do you have about his performance? Well, I, I tell you, I, I don't have a, a comment about him. I can comment about those people that I served with. Sure. But uh, uh, after I left the department, I, I would not comment on any of, the, of those new secretary okay. that I didn't know. Fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. If when you're, during your time, what, what was the biggest change in agriculture in between 71 and 94? What, what, what sticks out in your mind as rev, almost revolutionary? Well, speaking of revolutionary, we had uh, various ages in agriculture. We had the animal power age, which still existed when I grew up. You know, you had horses and you had uh, animal power. Um, then the, uh, the war came along and uh, there was a need for uh, uh, machinery to, to, to do these jobs, you know, the boys are off uh, fighting and so on. So the agricultural implements had uh, a huge development in this next period. So you had a, a mechanical age. Mm -hmm. Following that, you no longer uh, uh, cultivated for weeds. You, you used chemicals and uh, you nitrogen fertilizer, you know. And so then you, that became a chemical age in agriculture. And the next age is the farm management age. Yeah. Uh, of how you balance all these things together. A, a farmer, no matter what he does on his place, it's not important to his income as what happens outside of his fence line. Mm -hmm. And he needs to know those things. And that is the management age. Um, and now, of course, now it is huge consolidation of, of acreages. You know, if it, typical farm at, at one time, the definition of a farm was that the farm family provided the uh, manpower um, uh, and, and not beyond an additional half person. You could hire people. That, that, was, uh, that was a family farm. A farm, by census definition, is not a parcel of land owned by you and me, but rather an operation unit operated by a person. He might be running land from three or four people. Uh, he might have two or three parcels of his own, but whatever. A farm is an operational unit. And these became huge and are becoming larger and larger, uh, you know, at the present time. Uh, well, in, the, in yeah. this, Claude, in this yeah. age of of information and so many events outside of, of their fence line yeah. affecting them. So it sounds to me like what we need in this world 
is a modern day Claude Gifford that combines <laughs> economics and ag, exactly what you wanted to do uh, 60 or 70 years ago. So where is that next Claude Gifford going to come from? I have a feeling that somebody's pulling my leg here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we picked the right outstanding alum, didn't we? Absolutely. We have an ag program that tries to develop that person. That's exactly. right. The next Claude Gifford may be <laughs> studying right now. That's that could right. well be. Yeah. Actually, I said that tongue in cheek, but poor it, fellow. <laughs> but you know, I you she? know I say that I say that in, you know lightheartedly. But actually, you do need someone that combines agriculture, that combines economics, that right. combines all those There's factors There's no margin on the for air anymore. Yeah. That, that person has to be educated. And as you were telling that, that story, each change has left people behind yes. because they were either reluctant to change or their mindset was such that they couldn't adapt. Yeah. So yeah. each time the people who could do the work became smaller. The, that pool is smaller. Yeah. And yeah. we see that here. We have students that enter that can't adapt or can't learn because it gets more and more difficult. It's yeah. less physical and more mental yeah. and not everyone can do that. Yeah. Correct, yeah. yeah. Well, you need to tell the ag department down there, there needs to be a banner, right? When you enter into Gackle Hall and say, will you be the, the next, next Claude, Claude Gifford. <laughs> that needs to be the mantra right. for our program. Uh, will, right. will that buy me lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yep, there you go. That's that paycheck. That, well, I, um, and he's this <laughs> Illinois farm kid who came to MCC. We have so many of them still doing that. They cross the river and they come to MCC for, he didn't come into the ag program, but essentially we just developed the articulation for our ag program to to go to Iowa yeah. State. So, yeah. you know, we're still, we still have that path. Well, that yeah, you, well, of course, when I was. You were pioneering in 1937. Yeah, well, when I was here, though, we didn't have an ag program no, at that time. No, no, and we had the first two year ag program in the state of Iowa. Yeah. And I think Clover, Everett Clover, Everett was the Clover, person. Right. And he uh -huh. was an ag instructor and he worked with Iowa State to develop this that, program. That, that, so. that name's familiar. And we me. even accept Ohio. Ohio sheep Farm princesses, girls. or whatever you were, you know, weren't you a sheep princess? I was a national. Gosh darn it! A I'm national not just sheep the Ohio princess. Ohio Farm sheep queen. Did you I'm know your national. niece in law was a national sheep princess? No, but you know, I my project starting out in 4-H and in FFA was in sheep. It all comes and, full circle, Claude. And, and let me tell you what happened. They got I, hoof and mouth. No, <laughs> no, I went to the uh, the, the county fair. Um, um, to the fat lamb contest, and uh, <laughs> that sounds like something I could have won. Uh, yeah, the fat well, lamb contest. Yeah, uh, but uh, there was a, a lamb entered that uh, had not uh, been uh, neutered, so to speak, and shouldn't have didn't been. Didn't have in the, a weather. No, you that, shouldn't have that, 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 rams well, yeah, in the weather, weather class. So, no, right? so here is this ram lamb. So the, the judge has got us up there one and two. And he talks to the superintendent. He says, this is a ram lamb, shouldn't be in here. The superintendent says, well, uh, forget it. So that was what I learned, that life is not always fair. I hate <laughs> cheaters. Gosh darn it. <laughs> life so, is not fair yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so he, he won the, the, the championship with the, the ram lamb. Yeah. Oh, you see, you've not forgotten that. Oh, I will never forget that. Oh, that makes me mad. <laughs> well, I have, I have one final question to, okay. to bring it full circle okay. so when you reflect on this life you know this Illinois farm boy and, yeah. and knowing presidents and writing radio addresses and farm journal Riding and I mean on the Air Force One I mean you've done you you yeah. really have done uh, you know from a person that's interested in politics you've you've had some real dreams come true in terms of your access to leaders but I, I still go back I think we always go back as, as good farm folk do yeah. we go back to our roots yeah what this college that's now growing uh, and I, I think has, has progressed to a point where we can all be proud. What role did that play? How, how important was MJC, MCC to becoming the man that, that you became? Well, it, it was very vital principally because of debate. I debated two years for the junior college and Frank Prochaska, who was a chemistry prof, was a coach. I've heard a lot of uh, old alum talk about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, excellent, a outstanding person. 
uh, I don't know how much time we have here, but I can tell you that when we went to the, the National, um, we stopped off overnight in the Twin Cities. Now, we had told Pro, as we call him, that we weren't, weren't going to go to the National Contest. Well, why? Because we're embarrassed by you. Well, <laughs> how do I embarrass you? Well, that hat that you wear, <laughs> that hat's got oil around the band on the outside, and frankly, you know, we're embarrassed to go there <laughs> with this hat that you have. She said, okay, I'll buy a new hat. <laughs> so he bought a new hat. And we stayed overnight in the Twin Cities. And we were you went the, uptown? We went uptown out <laughs> on the street. And there are all kind of birds flying, <laughs> flying around. And wouldn't you know that smack on the, his hat, <laughs> this bird. And so we're laughing. Right on you know, his new hat. His new hat. And he, he takes the hat off and he says, of all the damn dummies in this town, that bird had to hit me. <laughs> I don't know what the moral is in that story. I don't know. But I bet if we think a little while, we could come up with several of them. <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent story. I think we can depart on that note. <laughs> Claude, it was a pleasure well, to meet you. Absolutely. I just hope I'm as articulate and bright as you are at 60. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to know. I hear a lot of, you know, I, I didn't, didn't you make a speech somewhere that I heard? Well, were you at the uh, Soldiers, uh, the Civil War I, Monument? I was. That was me. It and, was awfully hot and, that and day. you know, at the time, I didn't know you, didn't know who you were, but I thought, now that's an excellent speech. Very well, nice. I, congratulations. Well, to coming you. from you, that is an uh, that is an yeah. excellent compliment. Okay. So there thank you. you. Go. And you're well, an excellent thank you. you're an excellent relative. I'm your, to I'm your great niece, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, well, Claude, I wouldn't it's have picked anybody a else. I want you to know. I can I could sit and talk to you for hours, and since we're related, I get to. Oh, so okay. there, it's all a right. pleasure having you. Okay. And for all of you watching, I wish you had hours to sit and visit with Claude. But until the next time we meet. Grab your cup and fuel your mind. Thank you, Chadwick. You would think we.